Hello and welcome back. This is Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports and CheapGunsUSA.com in Westfield, Indiana, and you are watching Marksman TV. Today's video is a historical and technical overview of the Barrett M82A1 50 caliber rifle. Uh, we will be starting off with an unboxing and then I will kind of demonstrate how the internals function, how this basically works. Uh, and, uh, you know, just ba basically go over those uh, general details of the rifle platform. I'm not going to be shooting this in this video. This is just strictly a tabletop review. If you've been here before, you know the drill. Let's get started. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into an unboxing. And this is how kind of the, the M82A ones that are brand new are shipping out, at least uh, in this configuration. This one does did come to us in a Pelican 1750 case, really, really high quality. These cases alone will go for two to three hundred dollars, so it really comes packed up nicely. Uh, we'll go ahead and open up these latches here and show you what's inside. So covered in this brown paper, the Barrett M82 is under here. You do have your warranty instruction manuals and inf information, um, just whatever these little gadgets in here are, oil bottle or something like that. I'll set that aside. Really not a big deal. Okay, underneath this brown paper, you are going to get the M82A1 packed in its two separate components. Basically, your uh, lower receiver assembly, recoil spring, all that bolt is pinned in here, bipod, and then you have your upper receiver assembly with your barrel down there that's been collapsed in, and then your scope, if yours comes with a scope included. So I will go ahead and pull these out, show you how you get them prepared for assembly separately, and then we'll mount them together. Okay, now here is the upper receiver assembly and the barrel. Now again, the Night Force, this comes with a Night Force scope that uh, already came attached, mounted with Barrett mounts that do use four screws on each of the mounting points. Now this Night Force scope is a 3HV 3 to 10 by 42, and it retails in about the seven to $800 range if you get it on its own. These uh, mounts, uh, these rings retail at about the 250 range if you get them on their own. Now, to assemble this and get it ready for installation onto the lower receiver, we'll go ahead and sort of turn it up on end. You can go ahead and retract the barrel completely to its forward position. Now, once in the forward position, you will notice this buffer that's sort of moving back and forth. It's sort of like a hard rubber. You just push that all the way to the back, and then you have your spring loaded return springs for the barrel and they are incredibly stiff. You will see a little notch right here that this sets into. So without trying to exert too much effort, I'm going to go ahead and bring that back and put it into place. Now I went ahead and did that off camera just because I had to reposition myself in the barrel to do that, but it is under a lot of spring tension. Now the point of that is this is actually a short recoil operating system. So once fired, the barrel itself see if I can do this here, will reciprocate back like that in short, short recoil to begin the unlocking process with the bolt head. And I'll explain that a little bit more when I bring out the lower receiver to explain what's going on there. Once that's all been done, this is ready to go ahead and install onto the lower receiver. Now here is the lower receiver assembly and I'll go ahead and uh, we have to do a couple steps here to get this ready to mate to the upper. So first thing I'm gonna do is you have your two bipod legs. You go ahead and pull back and then out. This is actually just like an M60 machine gun bipod, very similar in how that functions. You go ahead and roll that down and then set that here. Now, one of our two takedown pins is actually held here, keeping the bolt a little bit to the rear position, which is where it needs to be to sit into the case properly. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring a little bit of tension off of the bolt from the mainspring back here, just enough so I can get access to this pin. I'm trying to do this at a weird angle here. Then I can go ahead and pull that pin and then that will allow the bolt and everything to sit forward, which is sort of the position it's going to need to be in to mate the two halves. Now from here, I'm going to go ahead and show you a couple things. So this is your main spring and it is held captive in this little housing back here. You do have little openings, little cuts uh, back here so it is not a solid piece, really just to lighten up the load and also if you can see debris or anything getting back there if you need to. Now, this buffer back here is actually held captive, and what this reminds me of is a buffer and buffer spring inside of an AR-15. So you know how you have that little pin uh, spring-loaded plunger in an AR-15 held up to keep that all captive so when you open the two halves, the main spring doesn't fly out and hit you. Somewhat sort of a similar thing going on here. Now, this spring is under an immense amount of tension. It is a very, very strong spring. 
Of course, you are going to have a massive amount of energy moving rearward after you fire the, the, uh, the Barrett. So you do need all of that to aid in buffing it so you're not breaking up the back of the receiver. Now from this point, if you want to, you can go ahead and remove the bolt. It is, again, not under any spring tension, so you can just go ahead and lift it up and off, and that's all you need to do. Now here it is a tri-lug bolt head, and this will turn to lock into the trunnion. and you'll see all that goop. This is actually brand new, but obviously it was test fired at the factory. But this will turn and lock into place once it goes into battery. Now there is a little tab up here I can push to release that. And then once that's pushed down, I can release that and a spring inside will return it back. Now on this side of the bolt here, you do have a little cam which is actuated by a surface inside the lower half of the receiver. So after it's initially pushed back under the short recoil, we saw the barrel move back slightly. That will start engaging the rear of the bolt carrier inside the receiver to push on this arm, which in turn engages a rod right here. You see that moving back and forth, which will actually push the bolt carrier group away from the trunnion. Uh, causing it to unlock the rest of its rotation. Once it's fully unlocked, it goes into recoil against the recoil spring. The spring then returns it, picking up another round, uh, pushing the, uh, the bolt back into battery. The, the bolt head turns to lock into the trunnion, and then it's ready for another round. Other than that, the internals of the lower receiver are very simple. Your sear is back here, which is actuated when you pull the trigger, and then you do have a safety on this side as well and an A2 pistol grip. Okay, so to bring the two halves together, what I'm gonna do first of all is set the bolt carrier group back into the receiver and just sort of just let it sit there and that's fine for now. Okay, now I brought back over the upper part of the upper receiver. Now, right back here, this little cross pin is just housed in there from when it was stored in the case. So I'm gonna go ahead and just pull that out. And this is our rear takedown pin, if you will, or a cross pin. This is for the front, you see the size difference. Now. What I'm going to do is there is a little crossbar sort of welded right in here. Just a nice little bar and on the front here is a ridge that sits right into that bar and then it sort of just lowers onto itself. So what I will do is go ahead and align that part now and let that sort of sit in place just like so and I sort of had to reposition that. So now it's sort of hinged on that little point that I just showed you. Now here I will have to bring back the bolt slightly so it'll allow the top half to completely come down on top of it. So I'm gonna shift over here and bring this back about halfway and then I'll allow the entire top half to sit down on the bottom. But I can go ahead and release that and now it's set, the bolt head is now locked into the trunnion. So it's, it's locked in place, I can't lift it anymore. If I want to take it apart, of course, I would have to do the same thing and bring this back halfway and that can lift up, but it's there locked into the trunnion now. Now that that's in place, I can go ahead and insert my cross pin. So the first, the small one goes up here. There is a little uh, notch here that I can go ahead and push it in. It doesn't really matter which way it goes in from, so I'll just push it in from my side. So that locks those two halves together up at the front. And then in the back, bring the camera over for you. There is also a similar place right back here. I can go ahead and just put in the rear cross pin and it just sits in place like that and now it is completely assembled. So some more details while we are up here at the top. Of course I mentioned we have the scope which is already fixed. Now underneath the scope there is a rear iron sight and up here at the front there is an iron sight that's actually folded down into this full length rail. Much like an IWI Tavor X95 if you've ever seen one so you can just grab that and flip it up. Now here on, on the rail is a removable carry handle, which is just has a thumb screw here. You can re uh, release, uh, loosen up and slide it off the front if you don't want the carry handle on there, but that's up to you. Now the original ones that were released in the uh, 1990s, so the first Amer American contract was in 1990. Before that, 1989, Ronnie Barrett, who is the designer, did have a contract, I believe it was with Sweden for 100 units or so. But the original contracted guns did just have a scope mount base here on the back, and this was all flat. There was no extended rail that went the rest of the way. Now they did have a front sight, which was just mounted up here at the front on its own, which you could flip up and down. It also had a carry handle, which was also just welded directly into the top of the receiver. Um, and then your back sight was mounted very much the same way. Now on the back here, you will see a monopod, which this one comes with in the box. It's how they're shipping now. They used to not come with one, uh, but you could always uh, order one and install it separately. 
If you want to remove the bipod, you can. There is a similar cross pin like we just saw on the two takedown pins, which you can push out and then that would relieve the uh, bipod if you didn't want to carry it for whatever reason. Now, the total weight on this is about 32 pounds, so that bipod is going to be very helpful for you. I would recommend probably using that as opposed to a bench rest or something like that, especially with the amount of energy that this is going to create and recoil. You're just a lot more stable having a really nice bipod on here. Now, it does have a very heavy barrel, and it is fluted to lighten up a lot of that weight. And actually, a lot of the total weight of this firearm is directed up here in the barrel. Now, your muzzle brake, this is sort of the most iconic thing about the M82A1. The M107 had a more cylindrical looking brake. Now, this was effective for keeping down recoil to the shooter, but if you are standing to either side of the Barrett, you are going to get a lot of, um, what do I say, concussion from that. So they're not fun to sit next to if you're uh, next to somebody at the range about to touch one of these things off. Expect to definitely feel it in your chest. Now the magazine itself is a 10 round box magazine and these are very expensive if you buy these individually. They're about $150 or so a piece. Uh, this does have a blued finish on it. I believe the original military ones were parkerized. Now it is a double stack magazine, of course, 58, or not 58, 50 BMG. Uh, same as the machine gun round, of course, from the Mod Deuce. So that was really the intent or the, the vision of Ronnie Barrett was to I guess the story goes he was observing a M2 machine gun and thought it would be interesting to have a shoulder fired semi-automatic variation of that for people. Really the intent originally was for sports shooters or enthusiasts who wanted to be able to use the 50 uh, BMG in a shoulder fired uh, rifle at the range or for any reason like that. It was quickly really identified that the use in a anti-materiel and anti-explosives um, or, you know, disposing of explosives ordnance, uh, really had its main practical use. So this is really not considered a sniper rifle per se. Sniper rifle itself is sort of a loaded term. Uh, but this is really an anti-material rifle. So this was really designed to be able to destroy or deactivate equipment, whether it's uh, vehicles or uh, really anything else, I guess, that would need to be destroyed from safe and long ranges. Um, Really, the effective range of this is well up over a mile, uh, again, with a good shooter. The round is capable of traveling beyond that. And your accuracy is, is uh, I guess it's anywhere from about 1.5 to 3 MOA, uh, depending on the ammunition you're using. Now, being a 50 BMG, there are uh, lots of different ammunition types available. You have your uh, armor piercing incendiaries and, uh, you know, rounds that actually do explode on impact. Um, which was, you know, during World War II especially, uh, when these were first really majorly implemented in uh, anti-aircraft uh, uses, I guess on really side and bottom mounted machine guns on the, uh, the bombers and things like that. Um, the amount of shrapnel that a 50 BMG round could produce was actually pretty good at taking down aircraft. So, uh, you know, we're sort of translating that into a more precise a delivery of the round, which is really where the M82A1 came into play. Another interesting thing about Ronnie Barrett, who is the designer of, of course, of this rifle, is uh, he has a he's he's really well acclaimed in the gun community because his stipulations with the government, as long as the government does not uh, prohibit private citizens from owning his rifle, he will contract with the government to manufacture them. Now. If the government decides to ban the Barrett M82 or the M107 or any variation thereof to the civilian market, Ronnie Barrett has vowed to cancel all of his military contracts. Like, well, I guess they're contracts, so he can't just outright cancel them, but not renew contracts for the future. So whether that would actually work or not, I'm not sure. You know, the military could design their own platform or I guess do whatever they want. I'm not too sure how that would work. Um, the sentiment is really uh, just, it's a great thing. It says a lot about the, the company and the designer. Well, that is all the time I have for you today on this. Thank you so much for stopping by and checking that out. If you enjoyed this video, please let me know by hitting that like button. If you want to see more videos like this, please go ahead and subscribe to our channel. And if you have any questions, please leave those down in the comment section. Again, I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports and CheapGunsUSA.com. You are watching Marksman TV. I will see you next time.